Okay. Let's get her going. Okay, what is it? <clears throat> it's a voluntary plan for egg producers and meat producers. It's specific to each farm, just like your biosecurity plan is gonna be. Um, it's industry driven. We started putting these together back in the mid 90s because of an SE issue in some folks back in New England that uh, got sick and some of them died by eating eggs that were contaminated with salmonella and aridotus. It's also an interest from some of your retail markers. Some of you are gonna be shipping birds or shipping eggs, going to uh, small retailers, farmers markets. And with a QA plan, you can set yourself up and say, hey, I'm just a little bit better than my competition because I'm looking at food safety. Because at the end of the day, yes, you're not one of the big boys. You may not have 3,000 birds, but you got 500, you got 1,000, but you are selling eggs, you are selling meat to the public. FDA and CDC don't care. You get somebody sick, they will track you down, find out where these eggs and, and uh, poultry was produced, and they'll come after you with guns blazing, and you are guilty of the crime. Now prove yourself innocent. And if you have nothing on paper, nothing to go with, they will put protocols into place that make it economically impossible for you to continue doing business. Don't believe me? Talk to Rose Acres. FDA made them put down 3 million layers for a salmonella that had nothing to do with the food safety federal law. If it can happen to them, it'll happen to you. So please, let's pay attention to what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna follow good manufacturing practices. That's the foundation of this whole program. Document, document, document all the things that you're doing. If you need help with that, I can talk to Maurice and give you examples of some of the documentation that we put together. Date, activity, and comments, approximate time that you did it. Look at me, do you see a watch on me? All right, that was my big beef with FDA. What time did you do this? Oh, about one o'clock. Oh, now it's gonna be about 5.30. Right? A lot of us don't wear watches for obvious reasons. So, but you still have to put the approximate time down you did it. Okay? All right, general principles. It's a pre-harvest food safety plan. Basically, we're looking at the food that you are selling to the public, eggs, poultry, meat. <clears throat> You're gonna to try to reduce foodborne pathogens. Salmonella is the primary one. Salmonella and aridus is the one that's federal law for folks that are raising, laying chickens in a flock of 3,000 or more. Now you may have small flocks, but if they're on contiguous piece of property, I mean they're all on the same property, I got five right there, five right there, if they add up to 3,000, you're in the radar. You will be tagged and bagged by FDA if you have not got this stuff started. Also we look at antibiotics, residues, withdrawal times, in this program, have complete records for the individual farm. They're maintained for two years. Basically, at the commercial level, what I like to see are records for the incoming chicks that you're going to get next week or you already have. You have records for the flock that's already on the ground producing eggs. Then you have the flock that was there. It's now been marketed. It's gone. So when I, depending on how you want to file things, if it's in a notebook, the front one third is the new chicks, the new flock, all the records that go with them. In the middle is the current flock. The one at the end is the old flock that's not there anymore. And as you shift them up, you can do whatever you want with that last group, but you must have records for at least two years if we're dealing with the feds. So far, they've only asked us for those records to make sure you have them. They haven't looked at them. But eventually someone's gonna say, where are your records for your last flock? And you're gonna be toast if you don't keep them. Okay, again, CDFA's got a safe uh, shell egg rule that it also involves flocks that are 3,000 or more. That kind of mimics FDA, but they have a little bit of things they want to do with it. And FDA mainly calls it a salmonella prevention program. But most of my clients don't have one. We have an egg quality assurance plan, and we stick that salmonella prevention in with it. I don't like having multiple plans. It's got 13 core components, three are administrative go over basically with production. You wanna make sure the actions that you, you do are recorded and you document them. Date and signature. Don't put white out on any of your records. You make a mistake, draw a line through it, do it again. 
lot of the records are on computer, which is fine, but you've got those records from somewhere. It might be a door card with fly crap all over it. Fine, that's what you're going to show them. That's what they want to see. Okay? If you have any deficiencies in what you're doing, you want to document them that you had a corrective action. An example is an egg cooler that's at uh, 48 degrees temperature when you, you, you check it. Right? They're going to want to know how long it took you to get that egg cooler down to 45 degrees. So you got to document, hey, at uh, 5 p.m., it's 48 degrees. At 6 p.m., I made my adjustments with my air conditioning units, whatnot, and I got it down. Or you can say, well, my doors were open. I was moving eggs back and forth. Well, then don't measure the temperature of your cooler when the doors are open. Do it first thing in the morning. Make sure everything is working. Don't create headaches for you by not doing the right thing with your record keeping. You can modify the plan, just like your biosecurity is going to be a living document. As time goes by, you will make changes. I guarantee you the biosecurity protocols you have right now today are going to be different in five years. You're going to do something a little bit different. Things are going to be happening. New research is going to be going on. Try this, try that, do this instead, because you'll put it into play. And again, you've got to make sure with the egg quality assurance plan, meat quality assurance plan, you meet CDFA if you're in California, and you also meet the FDA egg safety rule. <clears throat> CDFA, again, uh, in California, they're the ones that certify the egg quality assurance plans. Uh, they send a veterinarian or an auditor out to check to make sure you get all your components, all your record keeping, your production records. Uh, <clears throat> Also, uh, PEPA, Pacific Egg and Poultry, is the one that kind of kind of puts the glue together, keeps all this together. So if you are an egg producer, uh, you might want to be part of the PEPA program to make sure you get all the latest information going on with your QA plan. Now, the whole point of the egg quality assurance plan, it's got a little biosecurity thrown into it, so I won't uh, beat you up on that because you had a pretty good talk uh, from Zachary. But again, salmonella, uh, influenza, e and we all keep all these things out. Again, you want to reduce salmonella into your, your birds. because Some of these salmonellas can get into the egg from the hen and also from the environment. We also look at bird welfare. But at the bottom line, it's to produce, produce, uh, improve food safety because that's who is buying your eggs. That's who's eating your chicken. So understand, write only in your plan what you are doing. This is not a bloody wish list. Oh, I want to put this in here because I want to spray my vehicles when they come onto the farm. And you don't have one. Don't put it in. Okay? You get audited. They're going to hammer you on that because where is your vehicle wash station? It says so right here. Well, we're going to build that. No, 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 no. That's a different plan. That's your wish list. Things you're going to do in the future. You only put down what you're doing. And again, I like what Marie said, and it's my mantra too. Keep it reasonable, keep it practical. Because if you don't, it's going to last about two weeks and not happen. Because people will bend the rules because it's too complicated. All right? Again, look at your best management practices. We'll go over that. But document, document, document. Write everything down. Have a written plan. Okay, the first component is basically administrative. Okay, the first part, you have a brief description of what you're doing. Am I raising layers to produce eggs to the public? Am I laying meat birds, producing broilers? Name of the farm, date you implemented this, address, phone number, contact information. Who is going to be the quality control supervisor? <clears throat> You're also going to add a description of the farm, type of housing, how many barns. Keep it simple. So that's the starting of your plan. That's component number one. Component number two, just like the biosecurity, you want to have someone who oversees this. Could be the owner, could be your, your number one man or woman who takes care of raising your birds, but they're the ones that keep that plan in place. They make changes as they get educated, go to uh, meetings from the uh, California Poultry Federation or meetings uh, for continuing education with Pacific Egg Poultry on all sorts of, of uh, topics. They oversee it, they maintain the records. They complete the training because we do have, that's one thing different about our continuing or egg quality assurance plans and meat quality assurance plan. We offer training in the state of California. Okay, review it. Make sure it's working properly. Make the changes as you need them. Again, it's a living document. Number three, again, like we have 
We have training programs. This is, could be one of them. We do flock health management, vector and rodent control, which is another whole hour topic. Cleaning and disinfecting, another hour, an hour and a half topic. Okay, biosecurity, you just got that. Almost took an hour. Okay, I have biosecurity talks that take three and a half hours because they're very, very detailed. And I usually address those topics to the federal officials and the state officials because they always want this golden mantra, oh, you do all this, you'll prevent disease. BS. Okay, like I told or uh, Zachary told you, it's not if, it's when, it will happen. And if you don't have a written program on how you're gonna deal with that, you're gonna panic and make big mistakes and you don't wanna panic. Okay, again, document all the training, keep your certificates. If something like this organization doesn't have a certificate, if they have an agenda, print off the agenda, they have name tags, type your name tag on the agenda, date it, there's your documentation that you were there. I get that all the time. Well, no one sends me any certificates. Hey, you got an agenda, didn't you? Yeah, well then use that. Put your name tag on it. Sign off, date it, and you're good as good for your training records. Like in biosecurity whatnot with NPIP, part of the QA plan is we require that you purchase your day-old chicks or your pullets from NPIP participating hatcheries or producers who are also participants in that, okay? U.S. Uh, Salmonella enteritis clean program, so you're not getting chicks that have SE in them. Okay, have a letter from the state. If it's an in house hatchery, in state hatchery, you don't have to have an NPIP VS 9 3, which I'm having arguments already with the uh, state of California, because that document is for cross state lines. And so if you were dealing with a hatchery in state, get the letter that states that there are participants in the NPIP and they have a Salmonella enteritis prevention and clean program and file that with your flock records. <clears throat> Cleaning and disinfection of all transportation equipment, pullets, uh, pullet carts, trucks, vehicles. Uh, some people that are dealing with pasture rays, uh, they're moving them in small transportation crates or they're moving them by hand, then write that description down. I sanitize my hands, we get our, our PPE in and I move my birds by hand. Okay, or you, you put them in a small little trailer. Okay, clean and disinfect the trailer and document that you've done that. And also put, if you've got more than 3,000 birds, uh, they require, uh, at the start of this whole thing, they want it detailed and sign off on every little thing. What FDA did not understand was it takes a week, it takes 10 days, two weeks to clean a barn. I don't want you guys writing a diary on how you did it. Basic protocols, this is how we're gonna do it. I have a start time, finish time. That's what we provide them, and that's what they've accepted. So make sure you have two slots for start time and finish time. Okay, list all your feed suppliers. Make sure they participate in good manufacturing practices for salmonella prevention in the feed. That's of paramount importance. It's one of the common ways you can get salmonella into your flocks is through the feed. Not just SE, but all kinds of goodies that will hit your flock and make things difficult for you. And if you're not sure, if you get a nutritionist, have your nutritionist write the letter. But all feed companies that produce commercial uh, feed in California know about this, and they provide you with a letter. Make sure it's not 10 years old. Okay, update that letter at least every couple of years. If you're using animal protein, make sure the producer is buying that animal protein from someone who's making sure it's cooked properly, tested properly for salmonella because that's the primary source you're gonna get salmonella is through the animal protein. If it's not cooked properly, okay? As well as cholesterol issues if you're ABF for meat birds. You have a letter on file. Maintain a flock health program, meaning I vaccinate my birds, so have a schedule how they're vaccinated. Have a vaccination protocol in with the flock that you're dealing with, all date and sign when your, your vaccines were delivered in the ministry, whether it's Merrick's, Salmonella, Newcastle, bronchitis, uh, bursal, whatever, have that in place. This is when we did it, and this is who did it. Flock production records, mortality, any sick bird list, egg production, uh, market weights, with that, put all that in there, feed consumption, water consumption. Make sure you have a system with your feed tanks. First feed in is the first feed out. Otherwise, it accumulates, and pretty soon you've got mycotoxins and all sorts of stuff going on in your feed that's going to cause you long-term problems that are hidden until it's too late. Okay, your flock health is out of compliance. 
have something in writing and how you're gonna deal with it. Are you gonna call your veterinarian? Do you, who's a producer in here? Just one person? Do you have a veterinarian? Yes, you. I'm a veterinarian. You're a veterinarian, okay. So at least you've got one on staff, okay? If not, take birds to the diagnostic lab. Take some live birds, some dead birds. If you take dead birds, make sure they're fresh. They're not green, they're not blue. We call them post-mortem rot birds. They're liquefied inside and don't tell the diagnostician anything. So fresh dead, some uh, live birds that are, that are showing clinical signs of what's going on. It doesn't hurt to take a nice, good looking bird so they can do some comparisons at the lab. Okay, get that done, you wanna find out what's going on. Medications, if they're used, you wanna make sure that with the 2017 feed directive, that you don't go down to a warehouse or a feed store, go get some tetracycline, whatnot, because if they sell it to you, they just broke in the federal law. Because they're not allowed to. Gotta have a feed script. Gotta have a water script. Someone's gotta provide that script, and it's gotta be a licensed veterinarian. And you gotta keep those scripts for two years. Not just me, not just the feed mail, not just the VSI or WACO, you have to also keep it. Because they're not going to go, oh, I, I, the veterinary keeps that. You've broken the federal law. You've got to have that on file as well. Okay, and so make sure you date your medications, your dose. And a lot of people, when I say that, if you have your script, that's all on there. You don't have to worry about it. Pesticides, using insecticides, rodenticides, herbicides, make sure you document all that. It's called a uh, pesticide use log for those of us that, that put that together. Uh, the product's name, EPA number, when we used it, why we used it. Uh, keep that log in place. I have some pesticide training. You use the product label. You also use the MSDA sheet. It's what's going to get you in hot water is someone's going to make a mistake. They're going to have a pesticide exposure, a skin rash, something in the eye. If there's, and by law, first aid essentially right off the bat, and they must see a physician. Right? You don't see a physician for two, three days. It gets worse. They now go see a doctor. You just violated your pesticide laws. And they'll come down on you like white on rice. Okay, so make sure you train with the label. You train with the MSD sheets, you know, with the, faith, the safety issues, the first aid. Because both documents cover different things as far as pesticide application. So make sure you get that down. <clears throat> Everybody likes to store stuff. This is an outhouse with, from one of my clients. They knew I was coming. They knew I was gonna do an audit. So what did they do? Panic attack. Dr. Plant never uses the outhouse. He always goes to the office. And I had to go. So I opened that up and go, oh, you're not supposed to see that. And I go, see, holy crap, not crap, pesticides. All stored in there because they were just having them all over the place. And I said, you can't do that. They gotta be in a, in a specific storage area. that's ventilated, locked, and posted. That's the law. Anyway, the outhouse doesn't fit the bill. Yes, all my clients don't do the right thing sometimes as well. Maintain a farm pest rodent control as part of your biosecurity issue. Uh, this is a tin cat. That's a live trap, catches mice. Mice are curious, they'll, they'll run into anything. Uh, whoever sells these to you will convince you to put a glue board in there. They'll convince you to put bait in there, you know, a little extra, but don't, you don't need to. All you need is the tin cat. Put it up against the wall. Mice run in, can't get out. Okay, now you got to euthanize them. How do we do that? Anybody? How do you use live mice in a tin cat? How do you euthanize them? No creative thinkers here? Five gallon bucket of water. They can't swim. Okay. Uh, we, I won't tell you what some of the feds told me to do. Now I just release them. It's a whole point. I almost tempted to get their office number and release them in their office and said, here's your mice back. <laughs> what a dumb idea. Okay. Again, revert, you know, date everything, our observations, because part of this is knowing that your program is working when it comes to pest control. That's why you have a rodent index, and we can get into that later if you want to because you need to know that the protocols you have in place are reducing or at least maintaining rodents to a low enough level. If they start going up, you start seeing some around the building, then you need to intensify to get those numbers back down again. 
because it's not just the, the, the salmonella issues. You, you break down the word salmonella typhimurium. What's typhimurium mean in Latin back into English? It causes food poisoning, yes. Typhi is fever. Miriam is mouse. Mouse fever. So you get typhi Miriam, I know you get mice running around. They chew on wires, they burn down barns, they burn down structures, they eat feed, and they peel and poop all over the place and the chickens don't want to eat the feed. So they're very expensive to have on site. So get rid of them. Component 11, this is mainly for the meat type A coli assurance plans or pasture raised where they're raising uh, their chicks in a, in a brooder that's got a floor operation litter. And again, uh, uh, Zachary talked about your, your type of litter, shavings, rice hulls, maintain good litter quality, uh, soft and comfortable. I, no, I thought, sorry, that was uh, the first gentleman who spoke. Okay, written description, how you're gonna maintain litter quality, or you're gonna you take, take out the cake, uh, you're going to add uh, shavings to it to keep it nice, nice, maintain and dry. Uh, maintain good drinker management because that's how a lot of times it gets wet. It collects moisture and you have coxie issues and ammonia issues. If you have a pasture program and you're rotating, you put that in there. Put in your written program is how you're going to move your pastures around. How you're going to move your, your uh, uh, portable buildings around. And when are you going to move your portable buildings around? When are you going to keep your birds indoors? When are you going to put them outdoors? Based on whether, have that in definition and in writing. Component 12, cleaning and disinfecting the facilities between replacement flocks. Have a written protocol that is detailed. This is how I do it. This is how I clean this room. First step to the last step. This is how I monitor for salmonella if I have an SE issue in my cleaning and disinfecting. Because you also have to have what I call two cleaning and disinfecting protocols if we're dealing with layer operations. One, that's your day-to-day, -day, this is what I do. But if I find I have SE in a spilling, then I have to up my game. I have to do something different. Because again, if you're involved with the feds, they're gonna say, this isn't good enough because it's the same old, same old. You've got SE. What are you gonna do to improve your cleaning and disinfecting? So you're gonna have two protocols, okay? Have a written biosecurity program. There's a lot of examples out there. Uh, if Maurice wants, I can send him a lot more. You can pick and choose and see what fits. Don't reinvent the wheel. I don't sit down for a week and go, man, how do I start this thing? I gave examples to Maurice that's fair game to all of you. And if there's something on there, they're going, well, I don't see this. Talk to Maurice. Maurice will send me an email, chocolate milkshake. Boom, I get it done. Send it out to you guys. Now you have something to go after. And just modify it to fit your farm. This is our logbook, very important, especially with disease outbreaks and whatnot. And have your personal uh, protective equipment. Uh, see me, I don't fit in a medium, okay? A little person can, sit, can fit in the triple, triple X. They just tuck things in, okay? But I can't fit in the medium, not gonna work. So make sure you have big enough sizes for the big feds or the big auditors that show up like me so we're comfortable and not talking like this because it's stuck up and tight. And I can't bend over because I rip everything up. Okay, it's rather embarrassing. Been there, done that. Okay, and you can, you can get these from VSI, Walco, and Animal Health and, and put them in little uh, big two-gallon Ziploc baggies and just set them aside so they're available for a visit. Okay. The other thing I throw out, we talk about showering. Yeah, showering's not for everybody. But if you visit farmer's markets, every person is there raising poultry. Do they know how to recognize diseases? I doubt it. So when you go home, if you don't wear coveralls and want to have designated clothing, that's for the farm. Designated footwear, that's for the farm. I have designated clothing and footwear for the live bird market and for the farmer's market. The two shall never meet. I shower when I get home, line room my clothes, then I go visit my birds. Don't, you do that once, you'll do it twice, you'll do it three times, next thing you know, your birds don't look too good. Because you brought something home from the farmer's market. Protect your flock. The farmer's markets, the live bird market, whatnot, that's a disease central. Because most of the people bringing birds in have no clue what they have at home. But you will if you keep that up, okay? Line of separation. 
Kubota 13 includes biosecurity signs, uh, fences if you're going to have personal vehicles parked off-site. If people are coming visiting your pasture rate, don't let them drive all the way through to your pasture in the central. Have them park off-site. We don't know where those vehicles have been. Have hand sanitation. If you don't uh, supply uh, personal uh, clothing, whatnot, uh, hand sanitation, the foot bath, but the, the, the disposable coveralls, the, the, what I call the blue suede boots, the six mil, don't get the cheap kind. Get the good kind and roll up and sit up there and hang on to their, their feet. The vehicle wash station uh, may not be something you want to put in, but it's something you might want to think about if you're, in, and you're doing your enhanced SFS program for uh, enhanced biosecurity. You might want to look at maybe a spray, a small Hotsey sprayer portable that you put out there for two or three weeks while you're in the, the uh, END zone or the AI quarantine zone, because they're going to require that. So you might as well put that in in your enhanced. But a lot of the stuff you're looking at money and whatnot, you go, I don't think I need it. Then fine, don't put it in. And it's not a wish list. But with your enhanced, something you want to think about. Again, employees need to own this program, and certainly the owners. Um, the owners are my biggest pain in the butt. Well, I live here. I own these things. I don't, I don't have to do this. You know, they walk out of the farm, they walk into the egg processing plant, and dragging chicken crap all over the place. And here comes the egg processing uh, manager come over to me. We just talked about this. You need to talk to him. Look what you just did. You need to set the tone. You need to set the example. If you don't set the example, neither will your employees. Well, you don't do it, so why should I? So when you're not around, I'm not going to do what I'm supposed to do because the owners don't care. So like I said, my biggest pain in the butt are the owners. <clears throat> Validation, how you know this is all going to work, especially on the Samuel side is we have written protocols on how we swab for salmonella. Okay, pasture raise is gonna be totally different. You're not gonna go out and swab the entire pasture. Not gonna happen. Okay, I think I've given uh, Marie some examples of how I do it, depending on how big the building is and whatnot. I may do one or two swabs on the inside, one or two swabs within 15 feet circle around the coop, because that's where 90% of the birds hang out. And that's what I swab. Okay, but you have to have a written protocol so you follow that every single time. Commercially, we do chick papers, and I got protocols for that. Pre-production, 14 to 16 weeks of age. Mid-production, pulse molt, which we don't do in pasture raise, so you can line that out. And when you push the birds out. The feds require pre-production and mid-production. That's it. I very seldom find salmonella in those two criteria. I find salmonella in aridus and chick papers. And I find them most likely in push-out, pre-markets, when birds are going out and they've been there for a year to two years. So those I require. <clears throat> CDFA's Shelley rule requires chick papers, pre-production, mid-production, post-molt, and push-out. So you got to do all five. Now, this sounds scary for you pasture-raised folks that have never done this. You're not going, I don't want to be put out of business. So I can't disagree with you. So what I've suggested is at least do chick papers and do push out. Push out, you push the birds that they're gonna go off the farm anyway, you're gonna dispose of them. Test the barn you're in, test the area they're in. No SE, great, sign off on it, keep your lab report. Do your chick papers, because some of you buy your chicks from hatcheries that could do things a little unscrutable, because you're not dealing with NPIP. That's why do NPIP, get your chicks from an NPIP hatchery. But do those two points for at least two years. Come up negative, then you need to start biting the bullet a little bit. I might do mid-production for a year. Do chicks, mid-production, push up. Nothing in three or four years, then I'll do the whole gambit. Step. <laughs> wow. What happened? Time I minutes? I did that. I'm, not, I got, I'm almost done. <laughs> coming back. I think the feds yeah. were watching this. We'll fix him. Get him to shut up. <laughs> there, there. All right. So is that, is that understanding? We step you into it. Because I know it's scary to get into it. And you're like, oh my gosh, I can lose it. Yes, you can. But here's the beauty 
of the FDA egg safety rule. They don't care if you find it on your farm. What they care about is you don't fall over, stub your toe, panic attack, and you get it into the public. Due diligence, you clean it up. That's why you have a written plan. I've had numerous phone calls over the past 30 years. Dr. Plant, lapses, I got to see. What the hell do I do? I tell them, sit down, relax. The binder is right over here. I know where it's at in your office. Pull it out, open it up, read it, call me back. And in two hours, okay, this is what I'm going to do because it's all written down. What you are going to do. What three choices do you have? If you have a flock of 3,000 or more and you have SE found in the environment and they're in production, anybody, what are your three choices? We're, we're in trouble. You can use, now is that an FDA protocol? Because that's one of your choices. FDA protocol is that you can do egg testing. Egg testing? What else? You better been doing that beforehand. Mm -hmm. Euthanasia, that's over here because that's a farmer's choice, mm -hmm. producer's choice. Testing the eggs, that's one of your decisions. The other one is yeah. divert the eggs. Divert the eggs for the life of the flock. For the life of the flock. Do I need to divert the eggs during testing? Are you, an, are you an FDA official? No, I'm not. You, what are you? You're CDFA. Ah, oh, oh, this is great. <laughs> So, so it makes me answer a question without myself. See how it works? Yeah. <laughs> I had a feeling you were a regulatory one way or the other, but hey, that's cool. I got nothing wrong with regulatory because it's got to be done. Okay, so do I, as a producer, if I make the choice to test the eggs, do I, must I divert during that entire process? Now you can hold them until you get the test results. Does FDA require holding? No, there's nothing in the regs that tell me to hold the eggs. That is a Mark Bland decision, because mm -hmm. I don't want a bloody egg recall. That is the most political, most insensitive thing to go through, because there's, I did the first one in California, FDA told me, oh, just go on our website, it's all there. No, it's not. No, it's not. Even the floats are crazy. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So I take kiwi fruit and something else that's perishable, put it all together. My biggest headache was not FDA. It was Safeway, lawyers. You can't put that in there. No, 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 no. We went and go, hey, who's, who's a recall is this? Mine or yours? It's yours, but piss off. Excuse my French. Okay? I don't, lawyers are, all right? But that's why you want to hold them during each testing when the results come back. Then you have a choice. You can sell the eggs if you want to, or you can continue to hold them. You can only hold them for so long. But FDA does not require you to hold them. Doesn't require you to divert them through the testing process. You have two choices for FDA. Divert the entire time or test. Good, you're the, one of the first CDFA people that got it right. Thank you. <sighs> That's nice to hear, nice to see you. Okay, <clears throat> so we bent that one up. Refrigeration, store at 45 degrees or lower. Uh, you also need to, I didn't put this in here, calibrate your thermometers. Anybody have an idea how to calibrate a thermometer? You can send it off and have it done for 600 bucks. There's professional organizations that do that. How can I calibrate my thermometer, whether it's digital or whether it's a mercury? This is one of my, okay, we'll pick on Zachary because it's one of his interactive things he's got to figure out. Any ideas? All right, no, you're off the hook then, who else? Annie, you're going to be a vet student, veterinarian someday. Water, Pardon? 100 boiling water, 100. Okay, do you, 100 what? Is that what you really want to do? More boiling water? <laughs> boiling water? What's better than boiling water? Ice, Ice water. <laughs> boiling water hurts. If you touch I'm online it. said that, so give me some props. All right. So, just put ice, some water, let it sit for a while, get so it's slushy, put your mercury thermometer in it. Put your digital thermometer in it. It should read 32 degrees or zero Celsius. If it's off by one degree, you've calibrated it because every time you look at this, I'm one degree off. But you need to document that because the feds come up. How do you know that that uh, thermometer is accurate? Did you get it calibrated? Well, it's going to be 600 bucks. Well, you're in violation. 
So ice water, and you're golden. Okay, what's the 36 hour rule? They need to be under refrigeration in 36 hours. When does that start? Like I tell Zachary, if you don't know the rules, I can't have a conversation with my regulatory people. When does the 36 hour rule start? End of business day. End, day. end not business day. They, they, FDA goes by the end of their, their shift. Whatever the, you ask them what their business hours are, whatever okay. the end of the business day is, that's when they start. But you said something else, which is more accurate. What's that? When they're last collected. That's when it starts. If I get done collecting at two o'clock, mm -hmm. that's my 36 hours beginning. Okay? So make that sure. That makes you safe, but that, that's not how FDA calculates. I know, but that's why they're feds. <laughs> Okay. Records you need to keep, written farm, premise, flock, keep all of them together. So if I want to look at flock number five, I want all the records that pertain to flock number five. NPIP all the way through to push out and their results. Training records, NPIP form 9-3. If the hatchery is in state, we don't need the VS 9-3. It's one of my big arguments right now with CDFA um, because the 9-3 is for interstate tra travel. Okay, not within the state. Your coop, truck, CD documents, letter from the feed mill, your medication, pesticides, what you're using or not using, production records, egg numbers, mortality, feed consumption, your pest monitoring, so we have an idea, is our pest control working for rodents or is it not? Is it working for flies or is it not? So you make your changes ahead of time. You have the right to farm, you don't have the right to piss your neighbors off. So if you have a lot of flies, do something about it before the neighbors do. All right? Cleaning and disinfecting records, biosecurity training, validation records for all your monitoring. <clears throat> Some of the appendixes where I have full-blown written things out, which Maurice has. Protocol for cleaning and disinfecting, both for a regular cleaning and disinfecting and one for SE. SE positive cleaning and disinfecting, sanitation, drinking water, written biosecurity program if I have SE, because things are going to change. I'm going to isolate that flock. I don't want things moving around. Written protocol for SE uh, environmental positives. So like I said, no one panics. I have my three choices. Kill the flock, divert the eggs, test the eggs. Depending on the age of the flock, the market would not, you've got a choice to make. And don't make it three days from now or five days from now. I get this issue all the time. I want to put the flock down. Good for you. You're not saving eggs from this point onward. Those eggs get diverted because you've made that choice. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm not going to get into a, a pissing match saying, oh, you hung all those eggs and you sold them while you were waiting to depopulate those. I always tell the clients, when you make that decision within that day or the next day, then that's what we do. If you made a decision, I'm going to put the flock down, then divert the eggs, send them to breakers, whatever. Don't get yourself in the political quagmire. Have a protocol because every once in a while you will find positive chicks. What are you going to do about it? If you keep them, what do you got to do when they come of age to start laying eggs? Pardon? Eight, well, put the flock down at 18, 19, 20 weeks or test the eggs or divert the eggs. So they fall in that play even though it was 18, 19 weeks ago. And that's got to be in your written plan. So no one goes, oh, we're just going to uh, give them on some, uh, some feed additive products to keep the seminal down. We'll vaccinate them intensely. Yeah, we'll be so No, you're going to have to test those birds or get rid of them or divert the eggs in 20 weeks, right? That's why you put it in writing so no one makes a mistake. 99.9% .9 of the time, they put them down. They don't mess with them because of the headaches and the problems. And then we have to deal with the breeders. That's part of the issue I have with FDA. They don't take into account up the food chain because we get SE positive chicks now and then. And it becomes a political nightmare with the, with the uh, hatcheries. Okay, questions? I have written protocols, I have stuff, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If there's something that's not there that you want, let me know. 99% of the time, it's already on my computer and I'm more than happy for a chocolate milkshake to give it to Maurice, to you guys. So are you okay having some of those posted on our website or do you wanna still- Everything I do is fair game to producers. Do you have a kind of a template for yes. a pastured or free range type producer? Yeah, I gave it to you. 
So give to Andy. Here, there, thumbs up. Okay. Nope. And it's pretty intense, but if there's something on it, if someone says, well, how do I document cleaning and disinfecting? Well, I'm pretty sure I forgot to send it to you. I got two or three examples, and I'll just send it to her. And you can pick one or, or from that, reinvent your own. So it fits your farm. The QA plan is specifically for your farm. Your farm, not mine. But you want to follow the core things so we don't get yourself into trouble. Can yes, sir. Can salmonella transmitted from the wild there? Yes. It's, to me, it's not a, I don't look at it as an SE issue. Okay, for wild birds. Okay, as far as this goes, what I can put pressure on to my clients to make sure they try to prevent wild bird access is simply this on the commercial end. What is the number one thing they're going to give me on a, almost a week to week, month to month basis? Lice and mites. You want to be dealing with those in your 100,000 bird flock? Uh uh. So keep the wild birds out. I don't want to talk about salmonella. I want to talk about those two things because they're far more common in getting into your big flocks. And they don't want to mess with insecticides and whatnot to try to spray. So some of these facilities, it's difficult to do. These aviaries with 100,000 birds in them, try spraying those boogers. Ain't going to happen. You pile them, all sorts of stuff. So don't let the wild birds get in. Put a cover over your cool cells. Okay? That, his young took one of my bioscreen stuff and put it together, which was great. The reason why you put a, put a wire screen put it over is the wild birds get up there and they drink in the summertime. We had a farm out at Lincoln, California, that in the spring, summer, and fall, we always got northern fowl mites in our turkey breeder candidates in the dark outhouse from 18 weeks to 29 weeks of age, like clockwork, every single time. We did all sorts of stuff. Farm manager comes up to me and says, you know, what do you think if I build a wire frame screen and set it over the cool cells on the outside? And I went, what for? So watch. Here comes the acorn woodpecker. <laughs> Plant one of their acorns. Creeping wire. And I went, okay, I get your point. Put it up there. He put it up there from that point forward for the next two years before we didn't use that framework. We never got another northern thalamite infection in any of our breeder candidates. And that's the only thing we changed was putting a frame so it stuck out about four or five inches. It was easy to put up, easy to take down to clean whatever you had to clean. No more northern thumb mites. That guy was so relieved because it's a lot of work to try to spray turkeys for northern thumb mites. It's a pain in the butt when you got 10,000 of them. And that's all we did was put that up there. It was his idea. So a lot of times, listen to the employees. They'll tell you a lot of secrets. Okay? And I've learned to speak enough Spanish that they're comfortable with mucho grupos. And here we go. Okay, what are we going to do? We're going to do this. I like it. Let's do it. So learn from your employees. I learned a lot from them. Okay? It's two-way street. Any other questions? And I'm glad you guys are here. Because it's a food safety issue when it comes to eggs. Right? If you don't do the right thing, you will not be in business very long. And it won't be these folks. It will be the feds. It will be the public outcry. How dare you sell all these eggs that are contaminated with salmonella and you made my grandmother sick or my kids die. I don't think you can live with that. So do the right thing. Good due diligence. And that's why we're all here. Okay. And I'll put a plus for the CDFA regulators. Um, I'm not perfect either. I'm dyslexic. I had a QA plan for all my clients. It took about the 25th inspection to have a young lady sit down and go, Dr. Plan, when do you do pre-production samples? 14 to 16 weeks. Turns the plan around and shows to me, why does it say 14 to 18 weeks? No, it doesn't. I went, holy shit, it does. <laughs> And I said, well, a long time ago, before you guys got involved in my world, that's when we tested pre-production, 14 to 18, because some people wait till 18, 19 weeks to move pullets. And I wanted to make sure if my client was buying pullets from somebody else, I wanted those birds tested. And I looked at all my clients, and it was all 14 to 18 weeks. For all, and they all been inspected two or three times by FDA, 
and they all missed it except this one young lady. So it's, it's nice to have a third party review the stuff and I'll make a, don't make recommendations, make suggestions. Right. Have you thought about this? Because guess what it's suggesting when I tell this to the FDA? It says, you're not, you don't have the authority, the expertise, the wisdom, the common sense to tell me to recommend something to me. But as a third set of eyes, make a suggestion. <coughs> guess what happens? You know, Reese talk about it. Does this bother you at all? I don't care. Let's just put it in. So guess what? Your idea gets put into play. Because you made a suggestion. It goes a long way. And that's just my give and take. Okay? So any other questions before we call it the evening? Anybody from uh, internet land? No. Oh, they must have snoozed. Okay. Thank you.